Uh, okay, look, Mr. Thank Bay. you, Chair, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. And uh, thank you, Vicky, for inviting me, giving me this opportunity. Um, as you know, <clears throat> different people have, will have different perspectives on security, whether we are secure or we are insecure. Some people say that India hasn't been as secure as it is today in, for many centuries. For the very fact that despite everything that our adversaries have thrown at us for the last couple of centuries, decades, India has survived, prospered, and is growing, and is in a state wherein countries like Pakistan, who have been perpetual uh, sort of drags on us, are today feeling jealous that we are leaving them much behind. And in fact, this very tendency might force them to change course since we do not have very many leverages otherwise. So people will disagree with that, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you have the right to disagree, uh, but that's my view. Uh, primarily because, and primarily because, whereas the fundamentals of a situation may not change, the way we look at a situation definitely needs to change in case we want to change the situation. I will focus primarily on trends as to what are the trends which are discernible today, very clearly. The first trend is that India's relationship with its immediate neighbors, South Asian neighbors, excluding Pakistan, have shown a trend, and that is that India is walking an extra mile. We are trying to look after their sensitivities, their sensibilities, and we are trying to make sure that India is neither seen as a bully nor as someone who is interfering in their affairs. And a clear case here is Bangladesh where the elections took place and we did not say whether everybody should be taken on board or how they should conduct their elections. Elections that took place in Maldives were definitely not to our liking but we refused to interfere in the way they wanted to do it. We said this is an experimentation in, 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 in electoral politics they want to go the radical way and do things, well, that's the first step towards democratization. Let them do that. We are today not forcing parties in Nepal to uh, come to some agreement on constitution making. So the fact is that India has stopped being a factor in a domestic uh, politics of our neighbors. Electro uh, um, uh, economically, we are trying to give them uh, maximum benefits uh, that we can and we say, be part of India's growth story. So we are walking an extra mile, except for Pakistan, like I said. The second major trend is the growing radicalization uh, in the subcontinent. And why it is important is because radicalization of one kind breeds counter-radicalization. In the societies which were considered to be much more liberal, people who are supposed to be considered much more liberal and tolerant also react at some stage and the recent case of the Christians demonstrating very strongly and lynching some people in Pakistan after the church were, two churches were bombed is, in a, is a case in point. Uh, second thing is that Pakistan's ability and willingness to somehow control radicalization is suspect, despite all the efforts that they're making today uh, by way of Zerbe, Azb and all that it is very, very difficult to see that they are serious about it and whether they are serious about this radicalization affecting somebody else. Third is that entry of ISIS or IES in short in the region is a disturbing phenomenon. Not that they are likely to succeed very much, but what happens is that the religious discourse is getting radicalized. Many people are getting ideas. There were about 30 odd people from Maldives, for example, who were known, known to have gone and joined IES. Two of their uh, senior leaders in Afghanistan have been killed recently. Many people in Pakistan have gone and joined IS, and we have our own cases from Kalyan and other places who have gone and joined. Some of them have been killed. Uh, people from Hyderabad, for example, were stopped at Kol Kolkata airport when they were trying to join. So it radicalizes, gives ideas to people, and that is what which is more long-lasting. And this competitive radicalization of the kind of what Al-Qaeda wants to do, what LET wants to do, what IS wants to do, they seem to be competing with each other for gaining affection of the people or adherence, of the, or, or adherence from the people. Now, the existing groups are increasingly talking about Ahle Hadith now, and um, uh, this is what is worrisome. Now, 
increasing networking of terrorists and insurgents groups is complicating this issue. And they are trying to bond across the borders. Now, the third uh, trend uh, is, which is not very far from us, are the developments in Afghanistan. America has realized that uh, they haven't succeeded. And the Taliban are, are now passing on a message to their people that they have defeated the second superpower uh, in, in a very short time, and that there is nothing that they should concede in negotiations. America, having also realized its own limitations, has outsourced this business of trying to get Taliban on board to China and Pakistan, to China of all the people, of all the countries. What has been the result? Mr. Ghani has gone to China, has gone to Pakistan, he has made concessions to Pakistan. Now, for the first time after change of regime in Kabul, Pakistani officers are now going for training in, in the, uh, no, the Afghan officers are now going for uh, training in Pakistani training institutions. He has also deployed ANSF to take care of TTP operating from eastern provinces of Afghanistan like Nangarhar, Paktia, Paktika, etc. So he is making all these kind of uh, so, uh, concessions to Pakistan. Whether Pakistan can get them on board, I am not too sure. And partially because the field commanders, uh, the Taliban field commanders in Afghanistan think that they, sh they have nothing to uh, really negotiate about. They are on the winning side, time is on their side, and therefore why should they negotiate at all? So there might be a situation where the top Taliban leadership like Mullah Omar, may not be able to carry everybody together. And so, therefore, there's a likelihood that there might be a disturbance over there. From the business point of view, uh, things like TAPI and all that may not come through for a very, very long time. Our surface communications with Central Asia may remain disrupted for decades to come. The fourth trend, uh, I would say, are the maritime challenges that are taking place now which uh, I think uh, General Roda will be discussing in greater detail. But the fact that it's not just how our trade through the sea can be threatened, no. Piracy, crime, but more importantly, also the geopolitical race for influence with smaller island nations is becoming very, very important. Now let me say that Mr. Rajapaksha's miscalculation that this was the right time for him to seek re-election and get re-elected before his popularity dwindled fast enough did not pay off and it was a godsend for us. In similar situation, Mr. Shinjo Abe probably called it right, that he was also losing popularity, but he called the elections before he lost it altogether. Mr. Rajapaksha, on the other hand, by fortuitous circumstances for us, he lost in this. But the situation is not stable still. Maldives, on the other hand, you see, is actually not listening to anybody, and that's what some of our people, diplomats, said anonymously, that they are not listening to anybody. Now, how does it happen? Why are they not listening? They're not listening because the global environment today is that they can call wolf at any time. A smaller country can call wolf and say the bigger one is bossing around. The bigger one is, is, is unnecessarily pushing us around. And uh, we are a democracy, our judiciary has taken a decision, and uh, the other country doesn't want it because it doesn't suit its interests. Those kinds of things. Pakistan, uh, the China, for example, a couple of years back, just three years back, was scouting for bases in Shessels and other East African nations. They, also, they have some facilities already given to their um, uh, you know, shipping, uh, but they were looking for much more. Now, this competition, to my mind, is likely to hot up even further. A word about how America looks at it, for example, because it is still an important player and, in fact, a resident power in most of the places in the world, world whether you like it or not. America today, the people in America today do not want military interventions, wherein they have to pay for those military in interventions and have to lose lives. But at the same time, they want to remain the preeminent power in the world. No harm, anybody would like to be, if one has been a power, one would like to remain a preeminent power. But they also understand that the costly interventions in Afghanistan 
and in Iraq, etc., which may costed them well over three trillion dollars. That's a huge money. Multiply by sixty to count it rupees, and then keep keep adding zeros. I mean, it's a huge, huge money they've uh, in a way wasted because the outcomes haven't been positive for them at all. So there is no appetite for costly engagements outside. And therefore, if they can pass on that responsibility to somebody else who can do that job for them, who can keep the environment benign for them, they would be very happy to do that. So therefore, American response to India's geopolitical sort of leg up in the region is becoming more positive today. I'm not saying at all that all our interests are congruent. They converge, they don't. Like the Foreign Secretary just said two, three days back, that there are conceptual difference in how we look at things. But as far as America is concerned, they are not hostile to our exercising a certain degree of geopolitical influence uh, in our region. Next one uh, is a slow march of democracy in the region. Uh, Bangladesh wasn't a shiny example of elections when all major opposition parties boycotted, it. And you know that still agitation is taking place and lives are being lost. Bhutan has been a shiny example. And again, possibly because the previous regime in Bhutan lurched too much, tried to lurch too much away from us, that the next elections that took place and a peaceful transfer of power that took place, I think is, is a very shining, good example of how democracy, democracy can progress even in not so developed countries. Nepal, on the other hand, is, is a hugely problematic area. Talking to our Nepali um, interlocutors from different parties, each one of them says that India has to pressurize others to come to some kind of an understanding and so that uh, you know the constitution can be framed. Madeshis want a particular thing. The Hill people wants a different thing. Nepalese Congress wants something else. UML wants something else. Uh, uh, the Maoists want something else. So it's it's a it's a huge game going on, and nobody wants to leave power. Present Prime Minister, despite being a cancer patient, doesn't want to lose power. K. P. Oli of the Communists, very sick. He wants to become a Prime Minister before he goes and meets his Creator, and. Others don't really, uh, are not ready to cooperate. So it's a hugely problematic issue. And the thing is that China is trying to step in. They increased their uh, aid to uh, Nepal last year four times. It has now gone up to about $900 million. And that's why they are able to influence the political outcomes there. Sri Lanka, like I said, fortuitous for us. Maldives, problematic. Pakistan. One thing, only one thing that has changed now in Pakistan is that this is the second political regime which was ready to be overthrown and the military refused to overthrow it. This is the, this is the only positive and possibly to my mind they will complete another five, they will complete their five years term. What happens whether they continue thereafter or not is not. But uh, and let me give you an underlying factor as to why the military doesn't want to do it. First of mm -hmm. all the problems mm -hmm. are so, but I'll mm -hmm. just finish this yeah. in 30 seconds. Yeah. Problems are so many that they don't want to take the ownership of those problems and ownership, the responsibility for solving them, that is one. And secondly, there was, in the past, there was a gap between the regime and the people down below who were forced to take unpopular decisions in suppressing the political dissent, etc. Now there is a disconnect that has come there. And therefore, the present army chief, for example, realizes this and he, he has very clearly told the people as for information that they will not take over power in any name. I think I'll stop there and if there are any questions, we'll take on later. Thank you.